you know, you're trading the market, you're trading price, um, and you know, you're not trading your PL, which is just what everyone's taught. You know, move your stop to break even. Why? Why do you yeah. need to do it there? Mm -hmm. Welcome back, everyone. I'm sitting out today in Melbourne with Chris Weston. How's it going, Chris? Pretty well, pretty well, thank you. Welcome, pleasure to have you here. And we are at the office of Pepperstone. First time I'm coming here. That's right, we're just about to move, yeah. so it's, uh, yeah, it's gonna go, we're gonna get ramped up into a, a, you know, the, the, to a bigger office, so it's gonna be a lot more exciting times there, I think. Awesome, I, I still like it. It's a really good view and really cool uh, background. I like it anyway, so. Yeah, it's a nice little look down, uh, down Collins Street, and uh, the sun's out at the moment, which is quite nice, but that's uh, quite a rarity for us here in Melbourne. It's usually uh, <laughs> freezing cold and raining. But <laughs> seen that, seen that, for sure. So we are sitting here, you are a trader, and you do something that I'm not really familiar with, which is kind of trading with macros. So I want to hear about that, but first I want to hear a bit of background about yourself. Tell people who you are, and a bit of background about what you do and where you're working. Yeah, so, um, I'm Chris Weston. I'm, I head the research team here at Pepstone. Um, I come from a, a background of trading and research. So, um, but the hardest part of my day is really trying to switch out between um, a strategist and a trader because they're very, very distinct yeah. things, right? So one of them is, is the great thing, I think the, the commonality between the, between the two is, is the ability to, to try and assess probability. You know, markets are a, a bunch of random events effectively and, and random probabilities. And, and that's what we're trying to do. The good part of being a strategist is we can devise playbooks around you know, key, key events and work out what the probability of a certain thing could happen. And we go back to clients and say, look, you know, we've got the Fed meeting coming up. You know, we, based on previous communication, we expect to see this. This is how markets may react. The dollar's going to do this. Fixed income's going to do this. Equity markets are going to do this. Trading it is obviously very, very different. You know, mm. you, the commonality is that you, you, you have a set of probabilities and, and you can work with that. Um, anyone who thinks they know the actual truth is, you know, they're obviously lying or they've got some inside information. So the hardest part of my day is, is, is trying to differentiate myself between being a, a research uh, strategist, I suppose, and actually then trading and reacting to price, you know, not necessarily just prophesizing, but actually reacting real time to price moves. Um, you know, whenever you get an analyst on TV or something said, oh, I'm buying the euro at this level and, you know, I've got to stop loss. That's not actually how it works in reality. You can say you can give levels, but it's actually how price reacts around levels mm -hmm. that when you're actually trading, that's what you're doing in reality. Um, but I come from a background um, of probably more on the sell side banking. Uh, I started my career in London um, working as an equity trader uh, for Credit Suisse. Uh, I moved over to um, Morgan Stanley where I, I was another, continued to be on the equity desk there uh, as a young lad. And, I think that sort of brought me on because uh, I was quite happy to be bullied and be you know, taken down the pub and <laughs> you know uh, be the whipping boy effectively. Um, but then I got into I worked for Merrill Lynch and I was uh, got into uh, working on the fixed income desk and working within money markets and commercial papers before they blew up uh, pre GFC. Um, and that meant getting quite a lot of exposure to FX trading as well. So more on the sort of hedging side of things, hedging a book. Uh, rather than, than straight out speculating, which is kind of what we do at the moment. And I guess most of your viewers will be doing that at the moment. Um, but it gave me some, a really good sense about global money flows. It gave me a sense of how, working with the, the fixed income fund managers, how, you know, how they, they saw risks in markets, how they assess risk and how they, they, they manage those risks effectively, because that's what they job. Wherever, wherever you're working at you know, an investment bank, whatever you're doing on the equity book, whether you're working on the fixed income book, yeah, you know, the thing they're doing is is managing risk, uh, mm -hmm. and and that's the thing that you know, that doesn't doesn't leave your situation whether you're you know, the greenest of, of FX tr retail traders or whether you're a you know the biggest institutional fund. Your your primary job is to is is to assess and, and and manage risk. I mean, obviously, your primary job is to grow capital in the in the trading account. That's what we all mm -hmm. that's what we're all trying to do. But you've got to manage the risk accordingly as well. Get that correct position sizing. And that's something that doesn't change, regardless of whether you're working at Goldman Sachs or Pimco, or whether you're, you know, one of your, um, one of your viewers and one of who, who work closely with you. So there's no difference between that. It's how you go about managing that risk, and I think probably the advantage that you have working for a big institution that you have, you know, very very sophisticated tools for managing risk. So our job as retail traders is to try and, you know do the best we can to manage risk and get a system that can manage risk accordingly to that mm -hmm. situation. So that's where I come from. I, I you know, I've traded uh, fixed income, various, all, all kinds of fixed income products, derivative products, uh, spot FX, forward FX. Um, and, you know, then I was, after coming over here, I worked for another um, retail derivative house called IG uh, before moving over here. So, you know, I've, I've worked pretty much, pretty much most products, to be honest. So it's um, okay. given me a, a good insight into, 
capital flows and, and how to take advantage and what's the best product to take advantage of a, a certain thematic. Awesome. I want to hear about your beginnings as a, as a trader because it's like, like you said, one thing to kind of strategize and plan and think about ideas, but it's another thing to trade. So how was it start for you as a trader? Well, I started, as I said, I started on the equity desk uh-huh. and working uh, with a bunch of guys and seeing how, how they went about um, managing their book. And, and I think back in, back in those days, there was a lot of market makers and they still do that quite hope quite happily in the U- in the UK they don't really do it so much here in Australia but there was a lot of market makers on the sort of mid cap side of things um, and the primary situation which I think is is is, is not as understood um, amongst retail traders is flow mm-hmm. yeah understanding flow you've got a market maker sitting there going oh we've, you know, we, we think there's been a, a huge buy order going through the market we think that's done now this is a great company but I think the you know, the price is full, or you know the market maker sitting there going, oh, you know we've got um, there's been a, a big seller in the market. We've identified this huge seller. It's been trying to get out of this stock for a long period of time. We think that's done now. Um, we've got this to offer you, and if you've got a great relationship with your market maker, you're basically going to go and buy that. And he's offering you different uh, situations. Mm-hmm. But it's about understanding flow, and it's about the flow of markets. And there's no difference in in FX markets. It's no different in fixed income markets. We were getting really good insight into flow uh, we were working with that and that's what really the thing I take out now is a guy who, who trades um, I trade uh, rates FX and global equity markets um, and while I don't trade individual equities anymore what I did take out of that and the first thing was was understanding the, the dynamics of flow um, and how money is moving around and how people are chasing returns and, and how that flow is dictated to by things like liquidity and and changes in, in liquidity measure because because liquidity is the, the oxygen of markets, right? And mm-hmm. and fund flow will be reflective of that as well. So that's what we will look for in, in the fund flow data. A lot of retail traders will look at things like the commitment of traders reports yeah. and, and see how futures trading is doing. I, I will look at the options market quite closely and I invite you know um, people out there to, to look at this as well. Things like risk reversals. So you know, if I'm looking at um, you know, Aussie dollar one week risk reversals, they are a, a reflection of the demand for put volatility relative to call volatility, and it's the skew of the differential effectively. So when you're seeing, you know, this the the skew at negative two, for example, on Aussie dollar one week, you know that the demand for one week puts is significantly heavier than the demand for calls. So you can see that the sentiment. This is a very liquid um, instrument rather than what you see with the commitment of traders report, which mm-hmm. obviously comes out. Um, on the week, on, on the Friday, reflective of what what futures traders were doing on, on the Tuesday, so it's kind of a little bit stale. Um, but this gives me a good insight into a really liquid, um, real time vision of, of how people are demand- going through there, and how their stance is on the market as well. So we can use these little tools just to understand flow, sentiment, positioning, and again, it all just leads to that big common denominator, which of course is. Uh, Probability in trading. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is a big thing. And you mentioned floor there. Do you think it's something that, because I feel it's easier to understand when you work for a bank or a big institution, but do you think that retail traders can understand the flow easily or find out how the flow is in the market? Well, it's very difficult, to be honest, because um, well, it depends on the, on the market. Let me start with it. It depends on the market you, you want to trade, right? Mm-hmm. So um, predominantly, uh, Pepperstone as a shop will, uh, will deal mostly in FX. Yeah. Um, and of course, FX is an OTC market, so getting hold of flow data is very difficult. I mean, we're in, in the grand scheme of the world, we're a small player. You know, the, the big big houses are sort of Deutsche and Citigroup, uh, and they'll see um, a reasonable chunk of the global flow going through. But getting access to that's very difficult. Um, that's why working within a bank, you'll hear about these flow reports, mm-hmm. and these guys will come out with reports for clients and saying, "Oh, we've seen huge buying uh, in euro dollar." But it's not just about where the euro dollar flows are going. It's about who's actually moving that money around. I mean, that's what's, I think it's quite difficult to trade FX and understand why money's moving around. I mean, it's not just me going out and buying the euro because I think you know, it's oversold and you know, the, the European economy is going to actually do a lot better than people think. I don't, I don't think that mm-hmm. for one minute, but I'm just saying what you've got is you've got so many moving parts. You've got you know, reserve managers buying and selling currency on behalf of central banks doing a money market operation. They're not speculating; they're just moving money and recycling money. Then you've got, um, you know, you've got real money accounts, insurance accounts, and and various players, and they might be looking to hedge exposures. And then you've got hedge funds who are speculating and you know saying that the euro is going to go up for whatever reason. And it's all just into one melting pot of flow data, and that's why technical analysis is 
so important for me because it mm. aggregates all of this, all the variants of players, every single buy and sell order that's gone through the market at any one time, it aggregates it into one situation. That's why I always tell new clients, and so the first thing you can do is go and understand price action. First thing you go and understand technical analysis because I can guarantee you, if you're looking at fundamentals, you're probably looking at the wrong damn thing in the first place. So let the market aggregate that into one price and understand what the technicals are telling you. You know, why is it going up? What is it what is it saying about sentiment? What is it just a position readjustment? Is it is the market giving you a clear message? And and try and understand the language that the, the technicals are speaking, the price action speaking. Because mm -hmm. when you're looking at flow, um, you've got to remember all the different players that are moving money around at any one stage. And that's what the investment banks will do when they're passing these reports around. They're saying, oh, you know, we've got big buy orders coming from leveraged accounts, you know, the, the big speculative accounts who borrow. Um, to get bigger positions, your hedge funds, for example. Or, you know, we've got real money accounts doing big buyers, mostly from Japanese. And, and and to them, that stuff's really invaluable. But to the average retail guy on the street, you're not going to be able to get a hold of that information. Yeah. I think there, there are probably websites that, that, that will display that, um, but they'd need to get it from broker reports in the mm -hmm. first place, in which case it's probably two days old. So it's, it can be quite difficult to do. Yeah, and I feel like in this case, it's kind of not super clear what you've got to do exactly with that information. So... You mentioned price action, and I feel like a lot of people want to look at price action, but either they don't know how, or they look at it like too narrowed or too broad. So how would you look at it, price action, in your case? Well, um, price action is um, the, 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 the truest lending indicator on, on a chart. Right. Right? So yeah, a lot of people here watching this would be uh, using um, a MACD or a stochastic or an RSI. I mean, that just follows price, right? Yeah. And there's a reflection of price. And, and, and the purest of all naked chartists, effectively, people who just hone in on price action will say, look, you don't need all these indicators. You don't need an Ichimoku cloud. I mean, you could, the chart will tell, the price action of the chart setup will tell you everything that, that you can see. You can see that it's had a, a big run. Yeah, I could tell you where the RSI is going to be straight off the bat. It, obviously, these things are great for com confirmations, and when things start rolling over, you get a, an increased probability that you know, that the, the moves happened. But the price action is is yeah, we'd probably start with using uh, and getting an understanding of candlestick analysis. Um, and what what it is is obviously it's a, it's a roadmap of supply and demand in the market at any one time. It aggregates everything that's going on, all the buy orders, all the sell orders, and it tells you a message. It tells you a message about who's in control of price at any one time. If you're looking for trends, if you're looking for breakouts, um, it's not just about how a journey goes from A to B. It's the quality of the journey, and price action will give you an understanding of, uh, of that, that journey that you're seeing there as well. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, if you're getting into trading, the first thing I would, I would, I would suggest is, is you know, getting an understanding about um, price action analysis, maybe technical analysis, um, but what, what is the market actually telling you? Um, and, and that will be part of your ongoing process that you need to do. Obviously, you know, identifying trades is, is one thing. And a lot of people say that's probably the easy part. The tougher part, of course, um, is, you know, what you're doing when you're in a trade, how you can, mm -hmm. you know, extract the most juice out of each trade, how you can cut out of that trade before, um, you know, at, at the right time without it getting too much of a problem, how, how, how much risk you're taking on, correct position sizing and those bits. So, you know, candlestick and I is, is great. For identifying opportunity and, on, and, and understanding the message the market's telling you. Um, but it can also be a fantastic opportunity to tell you when the market's saying get out of the trade as well. So it's not just about you know, getting in, it's also about getting out. And that can be the hardest point. Everyone's so focused when they start of getting into a position and making money. But you know, ultimately, as part of that risk management, the market gives you a pretty clear message that you're wrong accept it, have the ego to accept it and get the hell out of the position as well. And that's the position that it takes a long time to, to change that. So yeah. with, when I'm looking at it, um, part of the mindset that I, that I would go into a trade is uh, is, is the idea of, of trying to add to a position. You know, so start off small of the market saying, you know, your analysis is working. And I, I will use a fundamental backdrop to, to, to assess what I think is happening with the world. Uh, and that can take a long time to develop and takes a lot of time to, to study as well, which is mm -hmm. kind of like, it's difficult if you're a plumber and you've got, you know, you're working off site or you're a farmer and you're in a field, you don't have time to, to necessarily do that. Um, but I'll have a, an understanding about what is what is a market is really sensitive to, you know, is it is it economic data for trends? Is it political trends? What sort of economic data is um, is, is going to change that macro theme? Is it is it the low growth environment? Is it... Um, too much tightening of policy, which is it low employment? What is it going to be? Um, and then get the technical set up and price action around that as well. But, um, you know, I think if you can go into a trade, 
and 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 say, well, look, let's start off with with a small enough position relative to the account size, and if the market's saying that, that your analysis is working, perhaps you could look to build onto that trade. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that changes the mindset around from one of, oh, I've got to take my profits, I'm making money, let's get out of the trade, to one of, actually, this is working. Let's see if we can build on that trade. You know, if something's working in your life, you tend to do more of it. If it's not working, you tend to do less of it, right? And, yes. Um, it's a thing that you, you don't see enough of in trading. People will, uh, will reward things that don't work which is kind of crazy, right? But it's, mm. it's to, to, to do the opposite of that is, is one of the hardest things you'll ever do in trading. Yeah. And I think that's, that makes a lot of sense. But for most people, it's going to be hard to implement maybe at the beginning, like when they don't know like what's going to work and when to ask to trade, then they can kind of fall. Well, I mean, the, the thing is, every single educator that you have out there will say, oh, you've got to let your profits run. You've got to cut your losses yeah. early, right? And, 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 and if it was that easy, and we'd all be, you know, we'd all, every single retail trader would be making an absolute mozza. Mm -hmm. But it's... It's one of the hardest things to do, yeah. you know, the, the ability to, um, you know, to surrender a profit to be proven right. And then and, and suddenly, you know, you, you've gone from what was a winning trade and you're like, oh, it's coming off, it's coming off. I'm going to close it just to be a profitable trade. Um, when in fact, you know, the actual, you, know, you might work off daily charts, the candle hasn't changed or four hour charts, the candle hasn't given you that, that exit signal. And you're just like, oh, I'm watching my P&L, I'm watching my P&L. And the PL tells you to start panicking, and of course, emotion takes over and makes us start doing crazy things, um, mm. which is not part of the process. So, yeah, I think if you can go in there going, I'm, I'm doing well, it's, instead of actually just crystallizing that profit, I'm, I, maybe I can look to add to the trade, and it changes your mm. mindset. But again, that's incredibly hard to do. So, that's the thing that, that every new trader and, and most intermediate traders, and, and actually a lot of professional traders, uh, will find hard is is, is that, that that cliche that you hear time and time and time and again that you've got to let your profits run and you've got to cut your losers. I think cutting your losers is quite easy to do once you've actually become yeah. disciplined. Letting your profits run, I think, is, is quite a hard one. So you get all yeah. these people coming out and saying, oh, your winners take care of themselves. Well, I think that's actually not true. I think you, being able to, to extract more out of your trade is actually so difficult to do. Cutting out the losses for me is like, oh, it's not doing what I want to do. I'll just get out the trade and, and move on to something else. But you know, everyone says, oh, your winners take care of themselves. I think that's actually very, very difficult to do yeah. is to, to continue to let your profits run because you know, the psychology of your brain is telling you you've got to be successful, you've got to be a winner, you've got to be a winner. Oh, it's coming down, I'm, I'm losing money. And then you, know, you look back over a couple of hours later and the trade's back up in the profit again. Mm -hmm. you know, I, should, I should just get hold of it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the psychology is uh, of trading is um, you know is incredible. I mean, there's some, a lot of people out there who, who sort of look at focus on that side of things very well. Um, but uh, you know, for me, it's part of a process. And and again, you know how how you go about how you go about doing that's up to you and, and in your own strategy. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned a big takeaway here, which is the fact that you should get out of the trade based on the candlesticks, not the PNL. Most people do the opposite. They look at the PNL and then get out. But <laughs> I think the, the, that's a really good takeaway people can, can apply. So looking at the, 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 the market to determine whether to get in or, or get out of the trade. Yeah, I mean, but you see it all the time. I mean, even even pro traders will do it. You know, they trade their PNL, they don't trade the market. And, yeah. and, and that's one of the hardest points is, you know, I mean, you take a step back and you, and you say to a client, um, what is your what is your exit strategy? You know, you've been in this loss now for a while. Um, are you going to continue to let it run? They're, oh, I'm going to take profits. So I'm going to take profits when it's break even, or I'll close the trade when it's break even. And I'm like, well, what's the significance of the break even level? I mean, yeah. what does that mean? And then what happens if you were to to make a profit? You move your stop to break even, but you're just trading your P and L. You're not doing anything with the market. You're just mm. focusing on on that P and L line. Is there any reason to move a Move the trade higher, or the, the the stop loss higher. Has the market, yeah, moved significantly enough, or and, and yeah, just just psychologically because you're you're you, you want to move it to break even. I mean, what's the significance of break even? It's just that psychological thing that you can't make a loss, and that's what the people are so scared of. So, you know, the, you're trading the market, you're trading price, um, and you know you're not trading your P and L, which is just what everyone's taught. You know, move your stop to break even. Why? Why do you yeah. need to do it there? Mm -hmm. So it's, psychological it's, so it's kind of being based on logic stuff in the market as opposed to kind of your, your emotional reaction or your desire to move your stuff to break even. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, yeah, you, you've got to work on, on that situation. I mean, when I, first, when I first get into a trade, the thing that I look at um, more, than, more than other people, and again, this comes down to the ability, I've got things like Bloomberg and, and those things, is, um, is, is how much risk am I going to take on in a position in the mm -hmm. first place? So the first thing that a lot of people will use is, is realized volatility. They'll use historic volatility. Um, 
So they're looking at things like the average true range and looking at the average range or the true range over a set period. It could be five days is, is one that mm. a lot of people will use. Um, they might use things like Bollinger Bands to um, understand realised volatility, you know, the, the spread of dispersions from, from the 20-day of the mean and, and get an understanding of the, the, you know, where vol's been in that, in that situation. Um, and if you've got your, your ATR, you know, five-day ATR at, say, 80 points or whatever, you're going to probably you know, move a stop at least 80 points away so that... You know, whatever you see, it could be one and a half times ATR. But you know, for me, that's looking in the rearview mirror. Um, I like to I like to use the options market to, to give me uh, a guide for the future. So I'll go out at the beginning of my week, my Sunday. I, I'll sit there and I'll have a look at all the event risk for the week. You know, who's speaking? Um, what's the significance of their speeches? How does it feed into market pricing around interest rates? Are they rich? Are they, you know, have they got some way to go? What could that mean for the Australian dollar, for example, if we use that as one market? Uh, we've got a, you know, the, we've got inflation numbers coming out of the US. Um, how important are they as a, as a thematic in the market? You know, at the moment, um, inflation is not really the big problem. I mean, the problem is, is, is actual growth numbers. So we're looking at the, the growth numbers here in Australia uh, at this juncture where we're quite concerned about this feedback loop between um, uh, the fall in asset prices, housing prices, and the, the fall that we've been seeing in um, the equity market in Q4 and the drawdown and, and the impact that's having on, on households, um, the psyche of households and, and their propensity to spend money because you know, it's, it's impacted. We've got this kind of feedback loop. So while we, we're not too concerned about labour market dynamics, we're concerned about um, we're really concerned about things like you know, business confidence, Westpac consumer confidence numbers, house prices, and this feedback loop between deteriorating economics, uh, deteriorating real asset prices, and the impact that's having on um, you know the the perception of wealth and what happens with discretionary spending. So we're, we, when I'm looking um, ahead at the week and I'm looking at data, I know that the key thematic that, that the Australian dollar has been very sensitive to and the rate market's been very sensitive are these indicators here. There's, there's other tier one things like employment, which everyone's like, oh, it's just obviously the Mac Daddy of, of economic. But this isn't part of the macro theme at the moment. Unemployment's not the concern. So we're not even really too concerned about that. But I'll have a look over the week and, and, and I can make my own assumptions or I can let the market do it for me. And the good thing about implied volatility, and I can do overnight or one week or one month, is that the, the options market will say, we've assessed everything here, and this is, we, this is we think is going to be the change in volatility as a result of these parts. And now what we can do is we can actually use that implied volatility, we can put it through the Black-Scholes formula, or we can just put it through Bloomberg, and it tells you the implied move. Mm -hmm. So the good thing about using implied volatility is, is the market, the big boys have done the big assessment of all the event risk that's coming up, and it will give you an implied move over a one-day period, a seven-day period, or whatever time frame you want. So I, I tend to trade off four-hour daily charts. I tend to be in the market for anywhere between a day up to you know, probably a week, which is a decent time in the FX market. I don't I don't scalp markets. So I'm in the market for yeah, as I say, for between a day and seven days. So what I'll do is I tend to say, okay, fine, I'm going to use seven-day implied vol, which has had the market's assessment of all these various factors. It's forward-looking as opposed to realised and backward-looking, which is what everyone uses. Um, and therefore, it's more significant to me. So I'm saying the, the implied move in Aussie dollar based on, on the implied volatility using the Black-Scholes formula is 67 points. So that's the, the expected move over a seven-day period. Okay, there's a little bit of time premium in there as well, but the market's saying we expect a 67-point move. Now, of course, that can be wrong, and people then you know, do get options traders who buy and sell volatility through straddles and strangles and various factors like that. But they know pretty much all... You know, it, it is relatively on the money. So I'm going to I'm going to have a stop loss. You know, instead of what we use of an ATR, I'm going to have a stop loss above 67 points. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that's going into it. Now I know kind of how much risk I'm taking on the position. Um, I can then obviously look at the the actual size and the the amount I want to risk. So the implied volatility has given me uh, an expected move over a specific period. It's forward looking. The market's told me they've assessed all the event risk for me. Uh, and I can tell you, work out how much risk I want to take on, then before I can achieve my position sizing. That's kind of how I, I, I manage risk, and that's how I think about risk, is using implied volatility um, and the implied move rather than 
you know, realize volatility stuff that's happened and mm -hmm. it's kind of in the rear view mirror. Of course, that stuff in the rear view mirror is, is still relevant and, and people use it very successfully. So, you know, if you're using it, don't, don't pull, put it off. If you've got a successful strategy, yeah. <laughs> don't change that. <laughs> of course. Um, but that's how I think about it. I'm looking, I'm yet letting the market assess, assess event risk, uh, and, and, and what they think is going to happen as a result of that as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm curious to know what's your interest for macro and all the new something you had like natural or something you develop over time because you had to make it work and you had to research macro. Um, well, part of it is is because we got a lot of clients actually want to know what's happened. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, even people who run uh, expert advisors and, and EAs and, and and have a purely systematic strategy will say to me. Um, you know what's going to happen this week, and and yeah. so even if you're running an EA, one of the one of the reasons why EAs um, don't work is because the EA is set to do a certain function. It's not it's not artificial intelligence. It's not mm. it doesn't change. It, it it does its function, Fixed, and it's yeah. your job to say, well, this 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 um, algorithm is set to do this, and you, you work out whether the algorithm, you know, that EA has a a positive expectancy, whether it has a, has a you know, it has a, a statistical edge. That's, you know, when you're writing these programs, it's, does it have a statistical edge, not just in one market, but over multiple cycles and potentially over multiple asset classes as well. That's the, your test for robustness. Um, but the reason it works very well in one market cycle, so you might work, you might have an EA that works very well in, in high volatility markets, it might be a, a swing model, for example. Um, but if, you, if I could come out and say to you, well, if we have a look over this week, we're expecting a very, very tight range. In fact, implied volatility is very, very low. And therefore, if you're running an EA which works very well in these conditions, perhaps turn it off. So the reason um, a lot of clients who are running EAs don't, you know, aren't successful is because their EA is not set is not suitable for that market condition. You know, they might have something that, that works very well in a low volatility environment, and suddenly we see event risks coming up which they hadn't actually computerized. Or, or thought of, and then suddenly there's this massive ramp up in vol, and they've just you know they've blown up their account. Their EA has been trading, blah 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 blah, blah but it doesn't necessarily suit that backdrop. So, mm. you know, I'm not going to claim to be able to write EAs and, and encode, um, but what I will claim is that if you're running an EA and and or a systematic strategy of some description, um, understanding. Uh, or at least having an understanding about how how the the operating environment by which that EA is is, is working, because you know sometimes it will, if you're trying to maximise profit, being able to know when to turn it off and turn it on, because someone's telling you that this is the environment that's going to work, and actually that's that's perfect for my EA. So bang, I want to I want to put it on. I potentially could increase position sizing because I'm I'm more confident that that this is, this is the right environment for my EA. So. Mm -hmm. That, that's kind of what we've, we've got a lot of clients here who, who will trade EAs and we're trying to give them uh, an understanding about the, the operating environment by which their EA is, is, is trading in um, so they can work out whether they've got confidence to hold it in that position or whether they want to just turn it off for a period of time. Because as I say, each EA is set to do a function, a certain function. Mm -hmm. It works best in that certain type of market environment. So understanding the fundamentals, the, the things that are going to drive volatility and, and market changes, price range expansion, I think it's really important. Yeah. And I think that's kind of where people should also team up with their brokers because they could do all the work themselves or they could kind of look at the brokers, what they research, what they come up with and what they see in the market and then work with that. So is this something you see that people should benefit from? Kind of looking back at their brokers, see how they research things and applying it? Yeah, I mean, some brokers are better than others, right? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I write a, I write a daily, a sort of daily musing, which actually on a Monday, um, we'll look at... Uh, like implied volatility in markets, the expected moves and expected ranges over each currency pair and, and things like gold and, and various factors. Um, so yeah, you're more than welcome to, to get in touch if you if you want to be on that, that list. There's no sales pitch or anything like that. But uh, it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's good for people to, you know, even if you're the, the most staunch, um, you know, systematic trader and you have no real interest in, in understanding what the Fed is saying. You're saying, oh, the, I don't really care, price is price, and price is reacting to what this does, and my, my EA will, will trade that situation. But for me, it's, you know, I can still come out and say, well, you know, this the, the market, if you're looking at cable, for example, right now is, is you know, is, the implied volatility is very, very high. If you've got an EA, you're, you're basically fighting headlines. That's all you're doing. Mm -hmm. So can your EA react to headlines as quickly as... Um, you know, news recognizing algorithms who are in and out, bang, bang, bang. Because you know, when implied volatility in, in cable is, is, you know, sky high, say 16% on a, on a week basis, that 
you know, you could have a 200 point move very, very quickly just on a headline. And that's what the problem when, when currencies are political or driven by political news, um, you know, the fundamentals get thrown out the window. If you're scalping, you don't, your job is necessary. I think, I think it is to, to look at what the event, you look at the calendar, what is the event risk? And I don't necessarily want to be trading around that though, mm-hmm. those periods of time, especially ones that I know will potentially create um, volatility and, and create range expansion. Um, so yeah, it comes down to doing your homework and yeah. and, and, and knowing what, what events are doing. But yeah, if, it, if, if you can come out and, and, and your broker can tell you um, these are the operating environment for, for what you're doing um, and then you can sort of cherry pick these are the markets, which I, I don't quite, I don't want to be involved in something that, that's going to be behead, beholden to power, uh, to headlines. Some people love that, right? Yeah. You know, if you look at our flow over the last six months in, in, in sterling on cable and sterling crosses, um, there's been a mixture of people just going, oh, I just love vol, I just love volatility, I love ranges, I, you know, I love the fact that it moves so aggressively. Um, and then other people sort of get, learn a hard way and realise that actually, you know, I'm fighting up against a, um, a whole beast of algorithms who can who can react way, way quicker than I can. Mm-hmm. And, and actually, maybe it's better for me to be back in um, no euro dollar, which hasn't got any kind of move at all. It's sort of just range trading, and that might be much better for you at the moment. Or Aussie dollar, which tends to have a smaller move than cable as well. So... Yeah, these are the sort of things that, that we look at. Is is and, and of course, so that's that's a largely a reflection of your personality and your lifestyle. Yeah. And um, you know, people like uh, fast cars tend to like volatility, that kind of stuff. You know, mm-hmm. a bit of a cliche, but um, that's kind of what you see. So, mm-hmm. so that's why it's important. You know, having yeah. an understanding about the dynamics of the currency, or I, I'm focusing specifically on the currency market, but having an understanding of the, the dynamics and the characteristics of the market as well, I think, is really important. You know, mm-hmm. um, if I look at indices. Um, People love trading the DAX, the German DAX, as, yeah. as opposed to the ASX 200, because it, it just has that sort of that nice amount of volatility. You know, that sort of it has a two percent move quite easily, whereas the ASX will, on a big day have one percent move. You know, um, it's not as aggressive as some of some of the say some of the Chinese market moves or the Nikkei can move three you know, percent quite easily. So, you know, we, we tend to see people loving trading the DAX or the or you know S and P for example. They're the two big indices that people love to do. Why? Because of the, the characteristics of that market that people mm-hmm. find really attractive. It's got great liquidity, you know, it trades well off levels and, you know, it trades well and trades nicely, but it has that right, that sweet spot of volatility. And if you look at the S&P, I mean, for me personally as a trader, in, in what I do, I like the I like uh, the implied volatility in the S&P, or which we commonly know as, as the VIX index, mm-hmm. um, to be in between that sort of 18 to 22%. If it's around there, you know, it's got some life, there's some life in the market and it's moving around and it's doing what it needs to do, um, but it's not too crazy. You know, that's you know when you're getting at sort of thirty percent, it's because market will have a, a three four percent sell off because Stephen Mnuchin said this. Well, mm-hmm. you've got to be awake to react to that sort of stuff. You've got to be pretty much glued to your screen twenty four hours to be able to react to headlines, and, yeah. and that's what I don't like is is when markets are just beholden to, to headlines. But why are they beholden to headlines? You've got to ask yourself that question. It's because they've got a theme very much in the headlines, whether it's trade. Whether it's um, you know markets running too hot because of um, or too concerned about you know higher interest rates in, in from the Fed, there is a an overriding thematic that's taking. For it could be politics, like we're seeing in the UK. What does a Brexit mean? Is there a chance of a hard Brexit or a no Brexit or whatever it's going to be? There is a the market gets a it gets fixated on a thematic, and um, those thematics can obviously be almost binary for for an economy, and it's it's how. Uh, a currency will trade into those into those things that and and as we get closer to the deadline. So if we think about a, a market cycle over three cycles, you know you you get a major event like Brexit. Mm-hmm. You know the, the UK um, whether it's going to leave the EU on on, on the deadline on the 29th of March. We have a we have a deadline. We have a deadline the 29th of March. It's how markets trade into this and the series of, of um, it's the the series of, of moves that happen into this. The different meetings, different votes. And as we get closer to this, you'll see that the pound gets more and more volatile as we get to this key decision. Then you've actually got the vote itself, that deadline. And what you'll tend to see is, is I just wouldn't even go near it myself, because that's when you get liquidity issues. Um, you know, liquidity providers pull pull their bids and you get these kind of erratic moves. And, you know, then you get stops and limits and everything going off and everything just goes crazy. And that's kind of when you just don't want to be trading at all unless, you know, you've got that 
that risk for it. Um, and then you've got the aftermath. Once the market kind of knows what's happened and then you've got you know, every for reality and everyone sort of forms an opinion and it generally all sort of leads to one and then for markets trend. So you, mm-hmm. I, I like to, like to look at markets in three stages. One is, is we, we tend to have a, a key thing. It could be trade. We know there's a deadline. Um, we, it could be a Fed meeting. That could be a major change of policy announced. We have a deadline. We have a meeting. How markets trade into that. The market moves. Um, what happens around that time, which is kind of where you don't want to be involved, in my opinion, because it's just you know, erratic craziness that's going on. Liquidity is a major issue. And then it's the aftermath. And I think that's kind of where we are. So you know, when, when, you, when you've got a market that is fixated on a theme, a date or whatever, um, and it's how market, you know, that, that's when headlines become an issue because it's how that headline changes that middle date. Yeah. Uh, and that's when, you know, as we get closer... You know, you'll see things really wrecked, and that's that's what's that's very hard to trade those kind of situations mm-hmm. because you've got to predict the headlines, and then you've got to you know you've got to react fast to headlines. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why it can be difficult to know that. Do you trade different ways before and after the event, or it's like the same thing that you trade? No, I mean I don't at all. I mean trading's trading, um, yeah. but you'll you'll find I think the stage three is probably the the um, the easiest because you get less headlines. The market knows mm-hmm. the fact and it's yeah. kind of like the herd mentality. You'll get some big dog who comes out and tells you that this is what it means and then you get people like me saying, oh, this is what it means and it's kind of saying. Um, mm-hmm. But everyone sort of forms an opinion and you generally after a while you sort of, markets converge, everyone creates consensus and that's when trends develop. You know, trends develop because okay. everyone's doing the same thing, right? And, uh-huh. and that's kind of what we've heard. When there's such a big moving event, um, when everyone gets together and starts thinking as one, you get harmony and you get trends, and then you get order book dynamics playing through where people go, "Oh, yeah, this is going up. I'm going to stop selling." And you know that's when the order book dynamics come through and everyone's buying and very few people selling and people are prepared to pay higher prices. So mm-hmm. you know, uh, people markets don't go up just because there's a buyer and a seller. People are also prepared to pay higher prices to get yeah. them up there. So, but uh, going into into the major event, um, you know, you hear this this sort of term. Which is banded around all the time, which is markets hate hate uncertainty. Yeah. Well, it's the uncertainty of knowing what this event's going to look like. So if I take Brexit, so I say, yeah, we, we expect it to have a positive re- resolution. That's why pounds rallied from one twenty four up to one thirty. And um, but as we get a headline here that says, oh, you know, there's un- that, that suggests uncertainty, you get the pound coming off pretty sharply. Mm-hmm. Because you've also got to remember, like, and this is one thing that we we did at the the banks is 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 how do you effectively price risk? And what we know is that over the years is that markets have shown us that, that, that we're all really, really poor at pricing political risk. Mm-hmm. You know, go back to um, the UK referendum in 2016. Yeah, we saw massive volatility playing through in, in European and UK assets, massive volatility. You go back to the Trump election in 2016. You know, we'd all gone into there thinking, well, most people thought that, that, that Hillary was going to win. Uh, a lot of people thought Donald Trump was going to win, but I mean, how many people came out and said that, uh, you know, we'd see, you know, the S&P futures, you know, trade up 25% or so over the next few days, or we saw, you know, once Donald Trump took to the stage that we'd suddenly see, you know, S&P, uh, the, um, you know, uh, US Treasuries, you know, it sell off quite so as aggressively as you were supposed to see a collapse in world markets. It didn't happen. Mm. So plenty of people have predicted that Donald Trump would win, but no one had actually priced that actually... It's going to hit the world with a massive fiscal stimulus at a time when monetary policy was very easy. And in Keynesian economics, is that that's kind of like never happened. So, yeah, markets reacted. How do we price political risk? I mean, you go back to 2012 when we had all the European debt crisis. I mean, what we ended up seeing was um, a lot of the investment banks would actually hire politicians because they just didn't have a clue what the connection between politics, economics, and financial markets. And so that's that's for me is is, is I've got out and, and got an education around how politics interacts with financial markets because mm-hmm. politics, if you're looking at at, uh, at a, the hierarchy of, of, of volatility inspiring events, politics is is arguably the highest of all the lot because okay. we, we we're really bad at pr- pricing political outcomes and then yeah. if we get the correct critical political outcome, it's like well actually is, is it is the is the reality the, what we what we had anticipated and we're just not very good at that. I mean we're greater. Understanding how economic data relates into, you know, changes at Fed, uh, the Fed level, and and or the Federal Reserve, and you know, if data continues deteriorating, we're going to price in uh, rate cuts. We're already pricing in rate cuts for 2020. Does QE become an issue uh, or reality? And then ultimately, if we're going to get QE, what does it mean for markets? Um, you know, mm-hmm. What do we want to go and sell? Do we want to sell the dollar? Do we want to buy stocks? Do we want to go buy gold? We, what is it going to be? So that's kind of what I'm doing as a as a macro thinker. I'm thinking. 
you know, if this trend in economic data continues to deteriorate, you know, what's going to be the, what's going to be the ramification? Is it is it going to be that the Fed will probably look to cut rates in 2020 or late 2019? Well, we're already seeing the market pricing that in in the euro dollar and Fed funds future. There's you know, 18, 19 basis points of cuts being priced in. So the market's telling you, on balance, we expect the Fed to cut. Now, there's never been a situation where yeah, the market, the Fed will pause and then start cutting uh, without there being a recession afterwards. So then we think to ourselves, well, what will rate cuts actually do? Probably very little. Mm. Um, it will bring you know, US Treasury yields lower, which will probably be quite good for the equity market. Um, but w- what stage will the market subsequently go out and, and start pricing in QE, quantitative easing? Um, and that's what I'm sort of looking for. You know, is, is what is the triggers to do it? What are the things they're going to get us? What is going to be the data that's going to the Fed are looking at much more closely? And therefore, when I'm looking ahead at the week at the different economic data, um, I know each individual data point. How is it feeding with that that growth thematic? And then we go back to those three stages of the market that we talked about. What is that thing that we're looking for? How the markets trade into it? How does it trade around that event? Um, and so. Each of those different parts of the, of the three stages of an economic cycle or a trading cycle has different characteristics. Um, this part here, as I say, is like uber, uber volatile. Mm-hmm. You know, everything's crazy. Nothing really makes sense. Um, it's stage three that I tend to like. I, I like waiting for the fact. Um, and each of them has different characteristics. Like each each market has their own individual characteristics as well. And what market you trade and the session you trade it in um, will reflect you you know the sort of things that you're into and your personality traits and, and various factors as well i mean you know I, i'm a big believer in, in in understanding what works for you so yeah. you know this is kind of when you come into the latter stages of my trading process which is you know, actually analyzing what the hell you're doing you know, mm. this is the reason why so many people fail um and and you know you, you go to like a any hedge fund and and you have a, a, a trading coach who will sit down with you and actually say this is what you're doing right this is what you're doing wrong and 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 we need to do that if we don't have a trading coach and everyone should have a trading coach mm. um speak to mandy <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh but uh yeah no, to actually be able to sit down on a spreadsheet and say well I'm, I'm doing really well i'm trading these markets this this is kind of what i'm trading and and work out really to the to the degree of you know i'm i I've put, I've put every trade down. Well, actually, do you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm making a lot of trades, really good trades in, in, in the US, in that US-European time zone mm-hmm. because the volatility is there and it suits my trading strategy. It suits my style. But I'm actually doing really badly in Asia. Don't trade in Asia. It's pretty simple, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the problem is, is that people don't actually sit down and review what they're doing well and what they're doing badly. And that's why, you know, it's not... There's plenty of literature. There's plenty of people on YouTube who, who say that you have to review what you're doing, and, and and you have to, you absolutely have to review what you're doing, where you're going right, what's working for you, how you felt at that time. But for me, I mean, I, I know that I, I I tend to do most of my trading in that sort of European to US trade, mm-hmm. um, because the assets that I'm trading. Um, will react more strongly to the data that comes out around that time. Mostly if you're trading euro dollar, you're going to probably see higher volatility in that European to US time zone for obvious reasons. That's when German data comes out or Italian data comes out or the or US data comes out, right? <laughs> so you're going to see greater volatility in euro dollar during that time. It might trade in a very tight range during Asia because it's just reacting and there's no real catalyst. Yeah. Um, so you've got to know the sessions that you're likely to do. And again, a trading journal is something that helps you improve. You have to Find out what you're doing right. And the reason I, I think that not enough people um, make enough money is because some people are stupid. <laughs> and I mean that with respect. But also people, uh, you don't have to be clever to make money trading. You've just got just to, gotta, you've got you've to work at finding out what you're doing right and, and work on your process. And, 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 and not, when you don't do that, like, you're going you're gonna to lose money. You're gonna, your account's not going to make money. You're going to blow up. I, I think you've just yeah. got you to work out what you're doing right. And if, if you're losing money, find out why you're losing money. Don't just keep doing the same thing. Find out what are you doing. Wr- write it down. You know, I'm trading in the Asian time zone. I'm, you know, I've done nine trades in the last two months in, in Asia and I've got nine wrong. Okay, well, why is that? Maybe I don't trade in Asia anymore. Maybe mm. you know, is it the characteristics of the currency or the the index that, that don't doesn't work in that time zone? Maybe it works better in it's a European market it tends to have bigger moves in, in European time zone. So yeah, you know, I think actually sitting down and, and finding out what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong, the sessions you're doing it, you know, how you fail to the time, all those kind of things, and 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 study study your behaviour. 
I think mm-hmm. it's, it's really, really, really important. And that's why I think it's the number one thing. So this, this idea of what we call continuous improvement, um, it's something what all the big players do. It's something a lot of the retail um, guys don't do enough of. And, and if you want to be part of that you know, small minority of people, a small, small group of people that make continuous profits, you'll find that these people are, are studying themselves and recording every trade mm-hmm. and, 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 and then reviewing it, making time to review what they're doing. That, that to me is not appreciated enough. And, and I think if you can do that, um, you will you will see an uplift in your, in your P&L for sure. Yeah. Speaking of that, I'm really curious about, because I think a big part of success lies in like what you do daily, like your routines, the things you do on a daily basis. So for you, what does that look like a day in your life? Like are there routines you do all the time that you think are really important or is it like, I don't know. Yeah, you, you, you keeping, my, keeping, keeping my wife happy is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it keeps me out of trouble. Okay. Now, um, no, uh, yeah, like, you know, obviously the, the old cliche that, that trading is a reflection of, of your lifestyle is, it's obviously a hundred percent true, mm-hmm. but I have, a um, and, and my circumstances. So I've got, I've, I've got two kids and, um, I come into work early and I've got a job which involves analyzing markets. So I'm very lucky mm. that I get to to study markets all day. I have access to some 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 pretty amazing tools, you know, Bloomberg for example, and if you know how to use it, it can be um it can be really good for you. I mean, obviously if you there's there's you know, keep your process simple and and try not to to overdo it. So that's that's a consideration. But when you know what you're doing and what you're looking for, I think it's really important. So I'm very lucky in that sense. So I have a couple of kids and you know, I have a job which involves analyzing markets, so I'm in pretty early to 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 do that. Um um, but yeah, I'm just looking for opportunity, and I'm uh, uh, analysing um, what, what's what's going on, what the key thematics, how these markets play into those key thematics, what what are markets sensitive to. So I would take, for example, the Australian dollar. You know, we've been seeing that for a large period of time, very very sensitive to um, any moves that are happening in, in emerging markets. So it had a very very strong correlation with the Hang Seng, or uh, had a very strong correlation with um, the CSI 300, the Chinese mainland mm-hmm. index, and. We're, we were, we were saying to clients, look, I think that like, people are just using the, the Aussie dollar as a, pro, as a cheap proxy for trading emerging markets, um, which makes sense. You know, 35% of our exports go to China. Um, China's slowing down. Um, they're stimulating with um, liquidity and various factors. So people have just been using the Aussie dollar as a, as a cheap way rather than using the, the offshore yuan, CNH, to trade. Um, but we were saying, well, actually, you know, the Australian economy is deteriorating at the moment. And we are seeing the rates market starting to price cuts. We've now got a full rate cut being priced in over the next 12 months. So when does the Australian dollar become much more concerned about domestic factors and rather offshore factors? And, and we've now got that stage. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking at correlations in markets and, and what actually makes something move. And that's part of my job is to come in and actually find out from a fundamental perspective, what is actually making something move? So we use a lot of regression statistics mm. uh, a lot of um, correlation analysis to actually say to ourselves well you know what is what is actually making the euro dollar move right now what is making dollar yen move what is making the dax move uh, all these kind of factors what is actually if i can understand what's causing the move then i can understand looking forward at what, what's likely to continue changing that now correlations come and go and of course they do and it's our job to anticipate them as a fundamental analyst but this is what i come in and you know, a lot of the, the the retail guys who trade purely on fundamentals um, aren't actually looking at the right thing. Mm-hmm. And so, for example, um, you know, when I, I'd been looking at the Aussie dollar as a proxy of, of, of the Hang Seng, and I could see that at that time, like a, a six month um, regression um, using the Hang Seng as your independent variable had a, a 0.8, 0.08, um, sorry, 0.8 um, times correlation, which is yeah, 80% of the variability can yeah. be explained. So it's very, very high. Um, but as I said, we were waiting for domestic factors to change things around. And what we were looking for then was was the yield spread. So the, the, the yield advantage that you see in the US Treasuries over Aussie bonds. And when we were actually going to see that, that you know those dynamics widen in favor of US Treasuries. And if that the yield is is relatively higher in US Treasuries relative to Australian bonds, then you see valuation support for the for the US dollar over the Aussie dollar. And if we were overlapping that, we can we can see that there's now a very a much stronger correlation between that. So I'm looking at rate differentials, and, and I've got models that show yield mod, uh, differentials. Um, and again, so now we've got we've got sort of proof that the Australian dollar is looking much more inwardly rather than you know outwardly as a vehicle for people to use. 
Um, and then I turn around to clients and I'm saying, well, what, do, what are you actually buying the Aussie dollar for? Why? Right? So it's, you know, it's reflective of higher or iron ore prices at the moment. Why is that? Okay, fine. Well, if you look at a correlation between the Aussie dollar and the iron ore prices, there's no correlation at all. In fact, there's a negative correlation. So you're actually buying it for, the, for completely the wrong reasons, you know. So to actually, you know, overlap charts and actually see what's, what's making something move, what's making mm. it tick. And if you can understand that, um, you know, you can make an assumption about what, what it's sensitive to going forward. So even if you're the most you know, technical trader, you know, having a, having a look at the calendar and saying, well, we've got this, this and this, the, the market, you know, th these are event risks. But again, it comes down to um, what am I doing? I'm managing risk. This is a, this is a risk for my situation. Do I, do I want to reduce my position going into those situations or do I want to hold my position going into that? So that's something that we'll look at as well is if we know there's a volatility event this week, um, and it's outside of our control because it could go either way. It's a volatility event. You know, do we make the decision of, of cutting back some of that exposure into that event as well? So again, these are where fundamentals can play quite a key role in, in my trading. Mm -hmm. So you come in the morning, you do your analysis, and then you do recommendation based on that. And so what follows that when you, let's say, take a trade? Anything you do, any routines you have or... Well, no, so we, you know, as I say, the, the first thing is, you know, so we've, we've identified a trade, we've, mm -hmm. we, we like the trade, and, and then we look at implied volatility. Well, I'll look at implied volatility to give me a sense of, um, you know, where my, how much risk I can take and how, how far away my stop loss is. If I know how far much risk is, then I can understand my position size, how much exposure I want to have in the market. Um, so obviously, if, if my stop loss is further away, then um, I'm taking more risk on, I'm going to take my position size down accordingly. Um, but then I, I'm not going to go in. I don't trade with targets. I don't trade with limits. I mean, I, mm -hmm. As I say, I'll, I'll let the market tell me when to get out. So I might, I might only get a yeah, small risk reward. Um, but I'm going into it with the idea that you know what, actually, if this if this really starts working out, then I'm going to be um, I'm going to probably actually try and look to, to build on this 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 initial position here as well. That's that's the mentality I'm going in. It. I want the market to, to say, Chris, you're right. Um, build on this position, mm -hmm. and and you know I think. It, yeah, I like to believe that if, if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll happily cut out the trade before it hits my stop if the market tells me there. Um, but I've got my stop loss in, in place to, to protect me um, should something bad happen. I mean, obviously, you can get slippage. but um, So that's my situation. I'm in the trade. Um, you know, I've obviously executed the trade. Um, yeah, and I'll, 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 for my sins, I will continue to, to watch what's happening in markets and, and I'll react should there be some headlines which I think are specific enough for me to, to suggest that there could be a change but price will probably reflect that straight away before I can even think about that so so I'm watching the position I'm in the position um, and you know I think if the, if the facts change I'll change and I'll get out of the position but I'm hoping to you know with the, the logic that I'm hoping to add to the position that's the mentality that I'm going in I'm saying you know I want this to go through I mean I, I think if I was going to run my own fund it would be probably more on the sort of macro discretionary side and mm -hmm. a lot of those guys will, will you know, you'll, what you'll see with the sort of big CTA macro discretionary accounts is you'll you'll see, um, you know, probably sort of one percenters, two percenters here, and you know, your your losses will be, you know, half a percent or whatever it's going to be, but you'll 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 probably have something around sort of forty five percent win loss ratio, but then what you'll have is you'll have you know two or three eight to ten percenters. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of what you'll you'll, you'll see in a in in, in sort of a, a CTA sort of macro discretionary type thing, and and that's what we're looking for. We are looking for that that big change in in market dynamics, which is going to cause a, a sort of an eight percent, ten percent move in currencies pre leveraged. That that's what you need to be involved with. So the guys who yeah. actually the big sort of macro funds who who will do well will be on the right of a, probably two to three. Two, at least two, ten percent, eight to ten percent is pre leverage, and that's what they're looking for, and that's kind of what I, I want. If I can identify a, an emerging big change in macro thematics, I need to be involved in that. And, and when it happens, um, you know, you need to be adding to that position to, the, to to get as much out of that trade as possible. And how does that actually happen? Well, um, I think in, you're looking at currencies and, and, and the way that you work, you know, you always hear people saying, buy the weakest, sell, um, well, buy the strongest, sell the weakest. It's a great mm. place to start. Um, but what we look for is, is two things. Relative differences are at an economic level and changes that can continue. And the second one being um, changes in, eco in central bank divergence. So if the Federal Reserve, for example, um, their, their data starts becoming a little bit better and we start seeing a change where they start saying, oh, you know, we're, we're going to continue balance sheet normalisation. We're probably going to 
uh, move away from this extended pause period to now where we might we're confident to raise rates twice. Um, you know that's that's going to see a change of market pricing. Um, whereas in Australia, um, we we still see you know, economic fragility kicking in and rates potentially being cut not by twenty five basis points but by fifty basis points. Uh, and then you ask yourself, well, what will actually a rate cut do in Australia? Very little. Um, so then we start saying to ourselves, do we need fiscal policy? Perhaps, will that be an Aussie positive? But maybe we need to see um, the RBA use its balance sheet. Maybe we need to start seeing quantitative easing. So what we've then got is we've got this huge um, divergence in central bank policy. It's that central bank divergence which creates um, yield spreads widening and it's what creates trends in FX markets. When you see that, when you see that this is going this way, the central bank's going this way, and this one's going that way, that's what causes major moves. And that's what we're looking for as a macro guy. I'm trying to look for major shifts where one's doing that and one's doing that, and the market hasn't correctly priced that. And if I can see that, and then the technicals start working as well, that's when I start getting involved in the trade. That, that's mm -hmm. kind of what I'm looking for on that big thing. That's when you're going to get an 8 percenter. That's when you're going to get a 10 percenter, is when you see these, these sort of tiptonic shifts going through in, in, in two countries' economics. Because that's what currencies are, right? They're, they're, yeah. a, they're a, a, relative a relative play on one against another. So what we're looking for is, is, the, economic, is the economics to change and the central bank policy to diverge so sufficiently, so radically that you're going to see um, you know, everyone jumping on board that trade. That's going to create trends, and that's when you start seeing an 8 to 10 percent. Of course, you may miss the bottom, you may miss the, the very top, but you want to get the body of that. That's when you start thinking about Elliott Wave and yeah. all that kind of stuff. But the, for me, it's about identifying that early. When the market starts to warm to that idea, I need to be in it. And if the market says, yeah, this is really becoming a theme, I want to add to that trade. That, that's kind of what I'm looking for. That's that's the holy grail for me as trading is these massive shifts, these divergence in policy. It happened really, really well in um, sort of between 2012, 2016. You know, that's when we start talking about currency wars and, you know, one mm -hmm. currency getting too hot. So another currency, that central bank has to talk it down and, you know, that kind of bits and pieces. Why did they have, you know, why did currency wars exist? It's because you have these major changes at a central bank di uh, level, which means one person's currency becomes too hot. We need to, well, me as a, as a macro trader, needs to identify those, those things. So that's where my fundamental comes in. Mm -hmm. My technicals come in because, you know, I've seen the market telling me that this is becoming a theme. It's actually like becoming a market thematic. And then we start, you know, working our way through that trade. I mean, if you really want to extract p and out of that position, you, you get out the trade when markets are too rich, you know, euphoria has come through and it's over, then you get profit taking and you know when to get back in. But that's that's kind of my process is, is, is trying to work, you know, what is the what is going to create these divergence and, and when do we need to get in the trade? And that's when the technicals and, and the price action will, will tell me that, that we're ready to do that. So how can people find you? They will connect with you or reach out after this interview. Um, well, uh, you can reach out to me on, on Twitter. Um, I, I post a lot of um, updates and, and ideas and views on, on Twitter. Uh, Chris Weston underscore PS is my handle. You can sign up to my my, my daily my daily musings and 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 I write a daily. It's called the Daily Fix, and and we're trying to. Um, Again, just write playbooks on on events and what we yeah, really what I'm seeing in markets and yeah, we'll try and combine fundamentals and technicals and and yeah. So there's guys out there, clients who who just have no interest in fundamentals who just be like, I've got no interest in reading this and, and I'm fine with that. I've got no problem. Um, but I think it's also interesting if you if you are running a um, you know a systematic strategy for an EA or so or so that there is you, you still need. To, I think you can you can really harness the strength and the power of a, of an EA that. Um, through un using and utilizing it at the right time. And that's why I think fundamentals do have a place. Mm -hmm. um, that said, fundamentals are incredibly hard to get right at a yeah. retail level. I mean, they, they really are. It takes a long, long time to, to get that. And that's why I say just what is the message that the, that the market's telling you? What is it telling you from, from price action? Um, and, and so, but at the same time, the first thing I'll do with fundamentals is, is, is understanding the deep rooted thematic that's taking place. Um, you know, was it trade? Is it you know, Brexit? Is it um, you know too hot, too cold you know, economies or whatever? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean for monetary policy? Um, and what data data sets are specifically important to that that trend? Um, and if you can work out that, then you will understand 
the sensitivity of, of a data point to a currency or to an index or to the rates market or whatever you're trading, gold, oil or whatever it's going to be. So um, that's what I look for. You know, Even if you're a technical trader looking out at the calendar and saying we've got these events coming through and then working out whether they are actually a volatility event or not is, is really important. So mm. you know, you're, it just leads back to this point that we talk time and time again about you know, whether you're you know, myself as a retail trader, yourself as a retail trader or or you're working at a big bank, your job is to manage risk and it's how you go about managing risk. The first thing we can do is, is assess the event risk and whether we think it's important to the market. And this comes back to my point of looking at implied volatility. The market's telling you what they think is important and whether they think that's a volatility inducing event. Um, and you know, I like volatility at a certain level. I don't like it too low. I don't like it too crazy. Mm-hmm. If it's too crazy, it's probably a reflection that you're fighting headlines, and those headlines can can move markets two to three percent, which I don't think anyone wants. Yeah. You know, this is when people complain about algos and this kind of stuff. I mean, I, I think people who complain about algos um, are not trading markets as they should. You know. Um, uh, and I mean that with all due respect. I mean, algos move prices up, they move prices down. They only really get in trouble when they're moving prices down. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it all comes down to how do you trade and, and how, what sort of volatility structures do you like? Um, yeah. But for me, it's the, get yourself, you know, go back to the, the nuts and bolts. You need a process. And you're judged as a trader on your process. You know, these uh, people on social media who's, who come out and say, yeah, I bought the Aussie dollar, and then they come back and then they, Requote themselves saying, "Yeah, I'm great. I, I picked the highs on, I picked, yeah, I picked the lows on the Aussie dollar, and I'm the greatest trader in the world." Well, that's that's absolutely nonsense to me. To me, that you are judged on 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 how you've gone from the first point of identifying a trade or getting to that point of, of your setup. Yeah, you know, how you've how you've dealt with the risk, how you've managed uh, your position sizing, how you've executed the trade. You know, going through to how how are you managing that position when you're in the trade. Um, to crystallizing that profit or that loss and then reviewing it finally is the mm-hmm. review you know that, that that's when you can come out on social media and say I'm actually really pleased with the way that's gone not just because I've made a profit but because I've actually gone through my structure my process point one point two point three yeah. and I've done it as I should do and that's what every single person who's watching this 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 recording now they need a process we as a traders we have a process and you're defined by your process, and and if you deviate from that process and you make profits, well, that's great. But it, you should feel much better about yourself as a trader, is if you've followed it tick by tick by tick by tick by tick, and you've made a profit and you've grown the capital in your account. Because you're not going to win every trade. There's mm-hmm. no doubt about that. I mean, my success record is my win loss ratio is like forty seven percent or so. But you know, I still make money. Yeah. Um, but some people have an eighty percent success record. You know, it's not. It's just how they go about doing situations. Mm. But you're defined as a trader by your process, how you follow that process, tick by tick by tick. And that takes time to get there and feel confident in that process. But you can rest assured if you go amongst a decent trading group of people and you say, oh, I made a great trade, I followed my process and I made a great I made profit, then then you'll get more respect from someone that just goes, Oh yeah, I just bought the Aussie dollar and I've made money. I mean that that to me is anyone can do that. Of course. Yeah. So yeah, you need a process. If you can stick to that process, you can feel you'll notice that you feel confident as a trader you can get that positive expectancy and um, that's what that's that's the holy grail that, that people talk about is this idea of following a process and if you follow a process because you believe in that process um, yeah and all good traders will have that process what that process yeah. looks like will be down to you know you as an individual your own situation your own set of circumstances and you know how much volatility you can and how you harness that and go about identifying that mm-hmm. so yeah, I think that, that's really probably the most important thing you can have as a trader. Yeah, that's not so advice. And we'll put the link below for your newsletter if you want to subscribe and see this and, and read it every week yeah. or every day. That's awesome. And I want to thank you, Chris. Thank yeah, you so much. that's my, my pleasure. pleasure. Thanks for coming and, down to uh, Melbourne. Yeah, if you guys want to shout to Chris, check out the links below. We'll put your Twitter handle as well below. And uh, we'll catch you guys soon.